5, and it's in two parts, as it is oddly divided by wonderful exhortations on one, one side of chapter 5, and then returns to the topic of vanities. The first part, okay, it's working. Uh, the first part will cover chapters, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verses 1 through 7, and we'll call this honoring worship. The second theme chapter f- of chapter five starts at verse number eight and ends with verse 20, which is the vanity of wealth. So kind of an odd pairing, but you'll see where this all ties up. Thus far in our study of Ecclesiastes, we had five lessons covering chapters one through four. In chapter one, Solomon Koheleth, AKA the preacher, summarizes nature as we know it and his own wisdom experiences. And in here, we glean three important terms that guide us through our entire study. Namely, as Jonathan has asked us to do, one, under the sun, meaning a reality of life without God. Two, striving after the wind, meaning endless pursuit of folly. And three, all is vanity, that life is a fleeting vapor or a breath. In these two first chapters, Solomon describes his whole life experiences, his wealth, wisdom, toil, self-indulgence, and the endless repeating cycles of nature. And he wrestles with its purpose. And in verse 14 in in, in verse 14 in chapter one, he says, I have seen everything under the sun and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Those three observations we will see repeatedly throughout our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. From wisdom, laughter, hedonism, wine, works, and money, all, says Solomon, leads to emptiness. But how so? Chaplain Lynn covered uh, covered chapter three where Solomon makes some observations about the world and of our human experiences. A staccato-like poem of a time for everything. One thing is juxtaposing the other. And to what purpose of this back and forth toil, Solomon asks. We seem to be up against a divine providence. An unchanging truth which at times may may dumbfound us, but a truth we must accept. The toil is indeed our lot, as Chaplain Lynn elucidated for us. It's a gift that we must accept from God. In chapter four, somehow, if you were here last week, how many were here last week? Okay, so wine coolers became the cure for cholesterol. You remember that? Peach wine coolers to be exact. But Solomon tells us that the oppressiveness of life many times renders death more appealing than being born at all. It's quite strident. He who has not yet been is better off than those living and those who have died. Additionally, the thought of dissatisfaction of one's life gives rise and temptation to keeping up with the Joneses, as Terry Kim talked about last week. It's all about chasing after the wind. An ever-changing, shifting weather vane, no foundational satisfaction, all shifting sands. Chasing the wind is like accomplishing that bucket list with complete disregard for the eternity God has set in the hearts of men. Nothing we do or purpose to do outside of reverence to God can bring us satisfaction. In fact, this is the goal of the book of Ecclesiastes, is it not? To lead us to seek true happiness in God alone. But how? Solomon tells us, by fearing God and keeping his commandments. Now, personal observation before we proceed. It's very easy to misinterpret the tone and the chapters that we've studied thus far. They kind of sound pessimistic, perhaps negative. Anybody else get that impression? It's much like our study in Job whereby Three of Job's supposed friends turn out to be miserable comforters. And throughout 27 chapters, 
We hear this back and forth, peevish arguments, but yet, to those who know and fear God, wonderful lessons of the true nature and sovereignty of our glorious God. And the nature of who we are as sinners, sinful man in need of a savior. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful exhortations that we're about to hear uh, from King Solomon. Lord, open our minds and our ears as we uh, try and learn exactly what honorable, honoring, deserved worship is to you. Pastor John touched on this today, Lord. This is not so much about this facility. It's all about you and how we come prepared to worship you. Lord, we need your help to understand the scriptures, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Today's lesson will cover all of chapter 5. If you're interested in the resources used for today's lesson, uh, I'll have a list at the end, a slide that'll come up, or if not, just come and talk to me after, um, after the lesson. Short presentation for you. Okay. Any observations? We've got a lot of material to get through, but just for one minute, let's discuss this. What did we see? Anybody, throw it out. What's say again? Proclaimed Christianity. Oh, a proclaim to Christianity. What else? Maybe they are Christians, but what, what happened in the morning? Anybody's morning look like this? Yeah, I see a lot of smiles. I see some nods. Okay, James 3 deals with taming the tongue, which is a subject for another day. But in this case, everything was chaotic, right? And then what? What happens? They get to church and what? All smiles. Everything's good, right? So how do we prepare for worship? The first theme of our study is titled Honoring Worship and deals with five principles. Guard your steps, listen, watch what you say, keep your vows, and fear God. Up to this point in our study, Solomon has been sharing his experiences with us. The problems of the world, the vanity, and apparent meaningless for our existence. However, here in the opening of chapter 5, he addresses us directly and begins to offer us what we oftentimes yearn for when studying the Word of God, or anything else for that matter, and that's the application. The preacher begins to preach godly counsel and offers us admonitions and imperatives, much like we see through, through Proverbs. The preacher not only addresses the well-meaning person who goes to church, but all who go to church. It does not apply, though, to those that don't. Solomon sees a discord in the way people are coming to the temple for worship, much like this family. So he targets those who profess the faith, but have some, somehow forgotten where they are and what they came for. So what does he say? Verse 1, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Do you find it hard to pay attention? Do your thoughts wander during the sermon when we sing praises? When in prayer, are we easily distracted? Guard your steps, let's examine this. This is Solomon's first exhortation in this book, and this exhortation is God's word breathed out, breathed out by God and recorded in Ecclesiastes by Solomon that requires us, the ecclesia, to do something. He tells us that there is a right way and a wrong way to come to the courts of thanksgiving and gates of praise. It's not about the structure or the church facility you come to. As much as it is about a transcendent God, you come to worship. The God who is in the heavens and uses his earth as a footstool. A God who is up there while we are down here. The God who has always been and not the God who now sees things my way. Pastors to today see this all too often where praise and worship is turned inside out. The worship service becomes a scorecard of sorts, right? We rate the messenger over that of the message and his jokes, the music, the rules of the church, the list goes on and on and on. Solomon is probably troubled 
by what he sees from the throngs coming to the temple, the half-hearted ones who really don't listen and know where they are, perhaps the initial vestiges of consumerism and what I can get out of this service and other various distractions are entering the worship. And he admonishes them that simply come into church in his time, a massive, majestic, you see it there? I didn't miss it yet. Massive, a massive, majestic uh, temple. It took over 20 years to build. It is not the focus. What is important is why and the who we gather to honor and worship. In Ephesians 2.19, we can draw the connection between the then, that being back in Solomon's time, and the now, the time of Christ. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and, and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. But on the foundation of the apostles, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. This describes the spiritual building, not one of brick and mortar. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Christ now replaces the physical temple. The holy of holy structure of Solomon's day and its emphasis to the people. And for us, Christians, Jesus becomes the main cornerstone. The veil has been torn. In other words, it's much like saying it's the family that makes the house a home. While the church is the place we come to worship, it's not about the church building as our pastor, John, has repeatedly told us, nor is it about the symbols in it as the people saw in Solomon's day. It's about Christ and what he has done for us and in him, solely in him, we are being built together. And so the preacher tells us, both then and now, what? Number one, to guard our steps. And that's the scene setter after Solomon provides, scene setter Solomon provides for these uh, first seven verses. So how do we guard our steps when we come to worship? Thankfully, Solomon gives us some answers. Let's look at the second sentence in verse number one. He exhorts, he exhorts us that to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Simply put, to listen is better than sacrifices. Recall in chapter 1, uh, in, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, 22, when the Lord rejects Saul as king because Saul's disobedience in carrying out God's details and wiping out the Amalekites. Saul spared Agag and the best of his livestock, supposedly to give uh, as sacrifices to the Lord none of which the Lord wanted. So Samuel tells Saul in verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Solomon is saying that when you go to the house of God, the word of the living God is preached, and that first we must listen. So when we come to church, are we ready for, uh, to hear the voice of God? Is your heart open to instruction? Are you listening to the entire message, not just the application? For what good is the application of the foundational truth, the background, the structural bones that hold all that meat together is not heard and understood? It's like the 10-point guide for doing baptism, taking the Lord's Supper, loving your wife, bringing up your kids in the admonition of the Lord standing up for the national anthem. Why do we do it? If we don't have a starting point, a foundation that underpins our faith, we're no better than the same, than the name it and claim it charlatans out there that have deceived so many in church culture today. That if you do this, God will reward you with that. Just do these steps and everything will be okay. It's just another form of vanity. No substance, just a checklist of religious exercises or sacrifices to get you right with God. 
Is Solomon making any sense? Are my ears attentive to the message, he asks. If faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God, not just any self-help books on seven ways to a better relationship with Christ, we fool ourselves. Because instead of coming to the presence of our holy God in complete faith, in knowing who he is, and know who we are, in wholehearted worship to him, in spirit and in truth, we come to him with sacrifices that mean actually nothing to him. Sacrifices of fools. He even goes further and says uh, in verse 1 that they are doing evil. It's basically saying, I, me, will give you this just because, just because. We're just going through the motions. I stopped in the church on my way to the beach to drop off some money, partake of the Lord's Supper today, sing a song or two, and gosh, I wish that worship leader would not sing so many songs. So it's fair to ask, how do we prepare for worship? Alistair Begg notes this, it's not as important to be decked out as to be tuned in. Are we spiritually alive and joyful to show up? Did you find time to go over the sermon prep before showing up today? Solomon is telling us that mind and heart is preparation. It is essential. Reflect back on the chaotic video we just saw to emphasize this principle. Well, the Bible has much to say about how we come into the presence of God and how we worship in spirit and in truth. Here are a few verses. John Piper in Desiring God describes it, its essence this way. Worship must be vital and real in the heart, and worship must rest on the true perception of God. There must be spirit and there must be truth. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full or half full of artificial admirers. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivate shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous teaching. And I think Pastor John covered that in the first sermon. But true worship comes from people who are were, who were deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. The preacher is telling us that God is zealous for proper worship. And as with Nadab, and Abihu in Leviticus 10, offering inappropriate burned incense to the Lord. And when Ananias and Sapphira in, in Acts chapter 5 knowingly cheated the Lord from what he was due, in both instances, these people were struck dead for trifling and playing loose with God. Riken then asks, and he's our commentator for these lessons, when we consider these biblical accounts and compare it to our unholy worship, is it any wonder why we are still alive? It is an inexcusable refusal to worship the true God that brings his judgment on the unregenerate world, says MacArthur and Mayhew in Biblical Doctrine. The Puritan John Owen shows us God's incredible grace. And he says, if salvation were only for those who never slipped back, then none of us would be in heaven. Well, thankfully for us, through Jesus Christ's unwavering obedience to the Father, his perfect worship now belongs to us. As if we ourselves offered it to God. That what it means to know Christ, our imperfect worship, is accepted by the Father because of the perfect, his perfect worship offered by the Son. I'll say that again. Our imperfect worship is accepted by the Father because the perfect worship offered by the Son. Amen to that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So that's verse 1. Solomon says first, guard your steps, and secondly, listen when you go to the house of the Lord. Number three, watch what you say. Be not rash with your mouth. Let 
nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And you're probably saying, boy, I hope Rob takes this teaching today. But I do have a lot to cover. That's the text I've been given, so. This is Solomon's third exhortation. And while God is everywhere, and we should be very careful about what we say at all times, the preacher is especially concerned with taming our tongues in worship, in prayer, and what we preach. He drives home the point by reminding us where we stand on earth and where God is in heaven. He is eternal, ever-knowing, and omnipresent. We are finite, mortal beings. This is one of those Bible verses that quickly puts us back in our place. It is the creature versus the creator distinction and further gives light to Solomon's own perspective of life under the sun and the beginning of Solomon's enlightening us on the above the sun perspective as we reach the end of the, the, end of the book. So we should think before we speak. Gregory of Nyssa, a bishop in the fourth century wrote, knowing how widely in the divine nature differs from our own, let us quietly remain within our proper limits. How do we do this, Ecclesiastes says? Let your words be few. It expounds in verse number three with the parallel that states, dreams come when there are many cares, and so the speech of a fool when there are many words. So question, is this a case of the number of words we use? Anybody? Up and down, yes, no? In some cases, yes. We must be sparing for, of our words before God and not repeat our words over and over and over again. In fact, in the New Testament, Matthew 6, 7 tells us, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. The emphasis here is on the economy of words, being reverent and deliberate, not just babbling, but speaking from the heart. God listens with a stethoscope, not with a microphone. He sees the invisible, and he hears the inaudible. So don't let the quantity of your words usurp the quality of your words, says Alistair Begg. Of course, this does not condemn long prayers, right? Christ prayed all night. But what, is do what it does condemn is careless, heartless, mechanical worship, praying, and vain repetition. Okay, so we come to worship in the house of the Lord by guarding our steps, listening to the word of God, and by minding your words. And number four, by paying or doing as you vow. This is the last of the four exhortations of, of godly counsel Solomon gives us. Look at verses four to seven. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let your mouth lead you, let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. This charge is very specific. It deals with the promises we make before God. The preacher is saying, if we make a vow, we need to be sure that we pay God what we owe. How often do we play loose with the promises to God? Anybody want to mention any examples? Anything? Give me one. All right. Lord, forgive me for sinning against my wife or husband. I vow never to do it again. O oh Lord, I know I promised to serve you in a ministry, but, O oh Lord, I said I would tithe, but not before long, we are committing those same sins all over again. When we make these vows and break these promises, we are mocking God. Ecclesiastes also tells us that when we make these promises, to accomplish them without delay and to not promise what we can't or don't intend to keep. So strong is this principle 
that he further warns us, let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say it was a mistake, especially with what we promise to God. To do so, the Bible says, is sin, and that such sin will anger God, and that he will destroy what we have done or the work of our hands. At the end of Pastor John's sermons, we always get several points of application. And he reminds us as Christians that we have a responsibility, right? We have a responsibility, we heard the word, to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving ourselves. That's James 1.22. You've heard the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, as we know, our good intentions will never get us to heaven. They may, however, add to our condemnation if we falsely profess to know Jesus and not keep his commandments. That's Matthew 7, 21. And he tells us all too clearly, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Of course, we worship a most gracious and merciful God, don't we? A forgiving God that we can approach through Jesus Christ for all our broken promises and sins. Does that mean we keep on sinning? Of course not. You remember our study in 1 John, where John tells the churches in Ephesus, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seeds abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. And in Romans 6.1, when Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Finally, the section ends with the heart we must bring in everything we say and do in worship. And Solomon gives us a preview of the conclusion he is leading us up to at the end of this book. And that is to avoid living in vanities and instead live in reverence and stand in awe of God. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. That is not servile fear as that of a prisoner. It's filial, reverential fear, the fear of offending the one you love, Jesus Christ. We often want to paint Jesus as this soft, limp-wristed, let me come alongside you safe space savior. When indeed, Jesus himself said these words. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear he, fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. This is Jesus Christ. Our commentary ends with this though. When we fear God in this way, we will come to worship him with expectancy and awe. We will be ready to listen what he has to say. He is God after all. We will be careful what we say, limiting our speech to the words that are pleasing him. We will give God what he deserves, including whatever time or talent or treasure we have promised to give. This section in Ecclesiastes 5 was written to help us take God more seriously. Listen to the poem by author T.M. Moore that can help us remember these spiritual lessons. How brazen and dishonest people are with their religion. They will go as far with it as it suits their needs. So they attend the service and sing, sing the hymns and when they have to go, give a little money to the Lord. But do they live as one should do who made a vow to God? Don't kid yourself. Among their friends, their faith is on the shelf. Remember, God knows everything. He knows our hearts when we before him bring our worship and you can't fool him. So take a good look at yourself before you make the next appearance before God. And go to listen, not to speak, for he will know just what you need. Why any fool can spout a lovely prayer or sing a hymn about the, his faith? His words are mindless like a dream, 
although to people looking on, they seem impressive. Not to God, for words are cheap, just like the dreams you have while you're asleep. He ends with this. God wants your heart, my son, not just a show. Get right with him before you to him go. Very useful exhortation for us all, yes? Okay, that's the first section. As I said, there was a lot there. I uh, hope you gained something out of that. Any comments before we move on to vanity, which is kind of odd, but I'll try and tie this in where it goes from exhortations to vanity and wealth and money. Anything? Okay. We're back to vanities. That's what we've been talking about uh, in the first four chapters. I took this from uh, Jim George, one of our elders. He's an author. He's a member of our church. He's been away. I think he's uh, doing some work for his publisher. And uh, he's got some captions here for the word vanity. It covers everything that Solomon is telling us. All is vanity. The second section of chapter 5 begins with vanities of injustice. Let's read verse 8 and 9. If you see a province, the oppre- in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way a king committed to cultivate fields. What's he saying here? That money always finds injustice, and don't be surprised. Where money abounds, injustice is always present. We see this practically every day in the news, whether it's capitalism, socialism, communism, anyism. It's a reality of life in a fallen world. Solomon gives us no more than this other than to say, don't be amazed, don't be surprised. Almost as if to say, I told you so. And you don't need to look much further for those of us here living in Hawaii than our own city and county and the complete cost overruns of the rail project to know that the preacher is right. Amazing that this cost of this project costs more than an aircraft carrier. Well, the preacher says, Rob, chill out. Don't be amazed that these officials unfairly, how these officials unfairly attain wealth. He also tells us that in this bureaucratic or autocratic process, in the end, the groups most affected by this greed are the poor. The cronyism by where, whereby the political parties or the dictators skim money off the top, not at only at the very top, but at every level. And it leaves the poor, ordinary people on the outside looking in with no defense, no voice. Insightfully, he says, don't be amazed. Why does Solomon know this? Well, in 1 Kings 10, 14 to 25, he gives us a description of Solomon's wealth, whereby in one year, 666 talents of gold, that's over 50,000 pounds, and more beyond that came from businesses, merchants, and governors of the land. So great was his wealth that in verse 27, we are told that the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. And he made cedar as plentiful as sycamore in the Shvelah. So if you've been to Jerusalem, I can tell you there's no lack of stones. So that's a lot of silver. Second, in Chronicles 8, he tells us how Solomon did build such wealth and magnificent things by drafting as forced labor 153,600 resident aliens to do much of his work. No question Solomon was very, very wealthy. He got thousands of his for- in his forced labor camp doing public work projects, and he's impo- imposed very high taxes to all his people, all against God's law, to Israel's kings, right? 
Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, which states, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive gold and silver. Did Solomon do any of these things? <laughs> Absolutely. He broke everything. And before this, you see the term about all the horses and everything that he had. He did them all. Solomon lost sight of God's blessing and was ensnared by his wealth and greed and at the expense of many, all under the sun, and later on he claims chasing after the wind. All is vanity, Solomon says. So don't be amazed, it happened then, and guess what, it's happening now. And oh, by the way, it even happens in our churches, many churches. For those like me, though, who want to see some justice served, verse 9 in our commentary seems to offer some comfort in saying that this injustice will one day be exposed and addressed. Look at that verse again. But this is gain for a land in every way. A king, small k, committed to cultivate the fields. Some leader will come to, to level the playing field is what he's saying. And so it happened in Solomon's day. You recall that after Solomon's death, a massive rebellion against Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took place to protest Solomon's abusive power and tax burdens, resulting in a divided kingdom, as God warned in 1 Kings 11. I personally look forward to the real king who will one day come and level the playing field. Don't you? Moving on to verses 10 through 17, the preacher takes wealth and poverty now to a personal level. He's been talking about this in a national level, overarching. Now it's personal. Both our money and treasures are addressed here. And I like the way author Randy Alcorn in his book, The Treasure Principle, summarizes these verses. Let's take a look here. And let's do this. I'll read the first, you read the italics, okay? Whoever has money never has money enough. Good. All right. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. As goods increase, so do, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to harm, to the harm of its owner. All right. Starting to wane there. Or wealth lost through some misfortune. Okay, and you remember the next one from Job. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. All right, thank you. Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner writes, If anything is worse than the addiction money brings, it is the emptiness that it leaves. It will take a physical toll, produce anxiety, angriness, and bitterness. You all remember the novel and movie, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, right? I love this story. It's hard not to tear up in the end. Only when Ebenezer Scrooge is confronted spiritually with the ugliness and selfishness of his greed for both money and wealth does he repent and relinquish the vanity for that love of money and turns it around for kingdom purposes. And so the preacher, after describing the pitfalls of loving money and wealth, 
He gives us a better way to live and enjoy what God has given us. Verse number 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also who, whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Again, Solomon reminds us that whatever we have is indeed, as you stated, our lot, a gift from God. It is to be enjoyed and accepted, not worshiped. Under God, I can find joy in everyday things of life. Without God, life is meaningless. But with God, even money can be a blessing. The world God created is full of many rich gifts, but the power to enjoy them does not lie in the gifts themselves. Instead, it lies with the one who knows God and has a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Look at the last verse again. It is not a charge to forget your troubles in life. Instead, Solomon provides us peace in saying, when we know God, we experience so much joy that life's short vanity, this vapor, this breath, is all but forgotten. As I promised, here are some of the resources we used. I'm surprised that uh, I finished on time. I didn't think I was going to get through this. Are there any questions or comments? I just want to draw a, a, a small parallel here. So when Jesus went to the temple in his time, he walks in through the east gate and he sees a bunch of merchants. This is the house of God, Solomon's temple. 950 years practically before that, Solomon is giving us these exhortations. Those. Jesus walks into the temple and sees what? He sees a bunch of horse trading, right? He sees people desecrating everything that Solomon had built for God. Holies of holies. And what does Jesus do? He just wrecks the place. Okay? Wrecks the place unchallenged. I think Solomon's exhortations had something for us to live by today. I'd say so.